are the Meadow City Conservation Coalition, and we have been um, in action for about two years now. We are a group of Ward 3 and um, potentially Ward 4 neighbors who just care a lot about the meadows and want to be able to oversee some of our wild spaces. So, um, first I'm going to call the meeting to order. I'm Jane Potter. I'm the president of, of our coalition um, right now. And I wanted to tell you a few things that we've been doing in this two years. Um, we've established nonprofit status with the state. We are uh, in process of finishing up our non-status application for the federal government. Um, we have had presence and outreach at the now very popular veggie tour garden in August in the ward. Um, we've gone through the parcels of land in Sheldon Field and the associated agricultural parcels to understand how those have been held under conservation restriction with Broadbrook and we're looking into taking those over um, ourselves and overseeing them. And we're starting work with the Montview Farm and neighbors to see if we can um, help settle whatever is going to happen there and oversee it. So what I'd like to do now is to introduce Matt Everett, who's going to give the treasurer. Thanks, Jane. So my report is going to be brief. Uh, this year, we established our account at the Northampton Cooperative Bank and received a tax identification number with the IRS. Um, we have had uh, income and uh, income and dues and donations prior to tonight at $135. We've had $35.02 expenses, uh, photocopying for the most part which left us with a balance of $99.98. However, tonight we've already increased our funds by 50%. So uh, with, with new memberships tonight, and we want to invite everyone who's interested to join us. Uh, we have membership forms over here. Uh, it's, a, it's $10 a calendar year for an individual membership and $15 for a family membership. So we're going to take a break for a few minutes at some point. Uh, because if you would like to be a voting member, you need to pay me before our votes take place later in the evening. So uh, feel free to come and do that when we have our break. So that's it. Thank you. So I think we, we will get on to um, the vote. So if anyone wants to join right now <laughs> so that they can vote, please come and do so. Um, and otherwise, I'll hand this off to Maria. <coughs> I think we have like a really small number of voting people, so um, um, I have a question. How many of you would like to join? Because we could do this at the end and do the voting at the end. Shall we do that? Maybe? Let's do that. Okay. And then, um, and then we'll get on with the speaker and um, whoever wants to join and, and vote, um, we'll do it at the end. But, okay. Well. With that in mind, then, um, it's my very great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Lori Sanders. And um, I'm sure many of you know her. She is the um, host of the National Public Radio Field Notes, which certainly is much beloved to me and I'm sure to many of us. Um, and she's also the author of Rediscovering Northampton, the Natural History of City-Owned Conservation Area. And she wanted me to mention that she's also been very involved with the West Hampton Library, which is now among the highest ranked libraries. Lori, you were oh. Well, we achieved a, a, a status called LEAD, for those of us, uh, uh, low, uh, low Energy and Environmental Design. And uh, we have the only library, only public library in the Commonwealth that has achieved the highest ranking of LEAD, uh, the high ranking of LEAD Gold one of five libraries in the Commonwealth with LEED certification. Anyway, it's new news, relatively new news, and it's very exciting. Congratulations. Okay. Well. <clears throat> well, thank you very much for having me here tonight. This has been a fun presentation to put together. And I guess I'll just say, for those of you who are up front, if 
now may be the time and for you, Jane, to probably move to a different seat. <laughs> hey, Nancy. Um, and is there a way that we can turn the lights down sort of more? Well, you can or probably like turn, turn the side lights on. Turn those on and these off. Turn these off, off perhaps. Yeah. You know. Nice to see you. I, 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 I've said this before, so I, I know some, I actually I know several of you in the, How's that? oh that's much better, mm -hmm. in, the, in the room, but one of the first times I gave a talk years ago, um, and for, I, now tonight I don't have to worry about this particular situation happening, but I was just, you know, talking away, and the woman who had invited me came up and she said, could you pep it up because they're really here for the Dunkin' Donuts and the coffee. <laughs> so I see there's nothing here waiting. I can just go on and on. Can, can you see if I stand here? There's a boat, right? Somewhat? Uh, well, this is, this is a familiar view to probably all of you, and it's the, it's the view that many of us saw the first time uh, or one of the first times we came to the valley. It's the view from the top of the Skinner House. But here's a view that since all of you live here locally, or many of you do, this is a view that some of you know on the ground in, in the meadows. And the meadows are a special place. They're, they're a, a special landscape not only for us today, but they really help, well, they really shape the history of Northampton. And their history has been shaped by natural forces as well as human forces. And so I thought in terms of getting into the natural history, because there's some really special features here uh, within, within the meadows complex, I begin with some of the natural forces. And the story <coughs> begins a long time ago, and we're going to go back about 20,000 years, when the, this area was filled with Glacial Lake Hitchcock, what's known as Glacial Lake Hitchcock. And so that's this long, skinny area. So remember, if we were here 20,000 years ago, uh, 20,000 years ago, we'd have a mile high of ice on top of us, continental glaciation. But back about, <clears throat> about 20,000 years ago, continental glaciers began to melt faster than they were advancing. So they began to retreat. And an ice dam was formed around Rocky Hill. And that's what created this long, skinny lake. And that lake persisted and lasted for about 3,000 years. And that's about 12,000 years ago. So if we were here about 20,000 years ago, this, this is what it would have looked like, maybe 18,000, OK? And I'm going to just show you a, 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 little, a little view of what, of what it was like here in the valley. So there's the margin of ice it begins to retreat and the lake begins to form and then when the ice dam this debris dam went out in in rocky hill around but it's all glacial outwash plains that that we are landing on when we come in and out of bradley um, when that happened it wasn't like a bathtub plug that's what it had been you might have heard that story in the past but it was a slow decrease. And there were episodes where there was a lot of water that went out, but it wasn't just from a giant lake to nothing. There were smaller uh, glacial lakes in the middle. So, but after 3,000 years, there was a lot of clay that had built up. And the Connecticut River begins meandering back and forth across those glacial, those glacial clays. And right around the time that the lake goes out, around 12,000 years ago, that's when we have the evidence of the first people coming back into this area. And initially, everything was tundra-like. It was very cold, of course. But about 8,000 years ago, the climate really began to warm up much more. And so <coughs> from the last you know, 5,000 years ago, let's say, two, 3,000 years ago, the climate was warm enough here that people began having uh, agriculture. And Native people ha had been uh, working in agriculture for a while, and they were growing corn, that's the familiar thing, as well as beans and squash. 
But the corn didn't look like the corn, the sweet corn that we have now, which is really a product of the 19th century. It looked something probably more like this. But things, things begin to change. Those native people are here in, in this valley when the Europeans first arrive. And those are Dutch and French and English. And why are they coming? Well, it's sort of the same as today. It's global marketplace, right? And they're interested in resources. And at that point, the primary resource was this creature. And at that point, beavers were a, a, a prized commodity. This is a story you've probably heard before, but this is a beaver felt hat. There were other styles of beaver hats in, later in the 18th century, but in the 17th century, this was sort of the, the uh, hat du jour. And <clears throat> initially, uh, although there were lots of diseases that were brought in by Europeans, there were relationships, as many of you may know, that with native, native people and European traders that were actually fairly, uh, there, was a, there was an exchange and, and it wasn't all war warlike and, and threatened. However, around the, around the 1630s, a major smallpox epidemic came up through the Connecticut River Valley. So Springfield is formed in 1633 by a guy named William Pynchon. He was living over in England, but he was one of the principals in the Hudson Bay Colony. And this is his son, John, there. And let's see, is that? a little bit better. Um, <clears throat> and so in 1653, John, who becomes the, the wealthiest guy in the Connecticut River Valley in the next several decades, he, along with 20, 23 others, petitioned the general court in Boston. And they said, we would like to plant, possess, and inhabit the place being on the Connecticut River above Springfield called Nonatuck as their own inheritance. And Nonatuck is the native the Algonquin word for middle of the river. That's sort of a rough translation. And so, so they got permission from the Massachusetts General Court, but then they, then they decided they would buy the land from the native people. So they got permission from one place, and then they acquired the land from the, this chief who lived in this area. And what they provided was about 600 feet of wampum and 10 coats. And with that, they bought about, they, they acquired about 64,000 acres, which equals current North Hampton, South Hampton, East Hampton, West Hampton, parts of Warrenoka. And that was the chunk of property they got. Well, <clears throat> they initially thought that this would be kind of a trading post, but the land was fertile here. And just as the native people before, those meadows, because they are bathed with flood water each year, and clays, which is that glacial lake clays, clays have a lot of uh, electric charge. They're negatively charged. So if there are uh, ions like magnesium or calcium, clays hold it. That's why our soils here are so fertile, because clays have a certain type of chemistry that promote their fertility. So the first native people, uh, first Europeans who came by, by 1654, they were here. By 1655, it was known as Northampton. And within five years, there were 300 residents, and they started splitting up the meadows. And here's something that's, this is a map that some of you have probably seen before. It's from 1831. But they began to divide the meadows into these chunks of 15 to 86 acres. And they called them different names. And some of you may or may not be able to read them, but they're called Old Rainbow. Young Rainbow, Strong's Farm, Venturer's Field, Walnut Tree Division, another Venturer Field, Nook. Um, <clears throat> but this is the one that I like, because it's called Bark Wigwam. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> it really tells you a lot about what was here before the Europeans. This is the sort of providential arrival of the Europeans, and the land is already cleared. And <laughs> at that point, here's the Mill River, right? And the Mill River at that point flowed like this into what's now, this is Arcadia Wildlife Sanctuary, okay? This is a former oxbow on the Connecticut River. And in the, at a certain point in Northampton's history, they shifted 
They dug their trench and put the Mill River over here. And now we know that the Mill River actually now goes right here. Um, but bark wigwam tells you a lot. So there were, there were native bark wigwams. That first slide I showed of native people, they that had, those were bark wigwams. And a lot of people at that point, native people, lived here along what we now know as Conn Street, Dewey Court. And subsequently they built a fort up at Fort Hill in the <coughs> 1670s. But there were, the presence of native people, they would come, they would do some planting, and then there's a lot of seasonal movement. That's this new, so it wasn't a permanent settlement <coughs> like we think of based on archaeological work, recent work done by UMass folks up in Deerfield. Understanding is much more transitional coming here than going up to Turner's, uh, where you'd catch fish, mo moving around, but then loop, looping back uh, through here. And when the native people so sold the meadows, they were also, they still had some rights to do some farming there, at least initially. Question? Yeah. Did they sell the whole meadow? They sold, they sold Northampton, Southampton, oh, Eastampton, yeah, yeah. 64,000 more or less acres. But their terms of sale were very understood the way we understand. Very, very differently. Yeah. That's right. They just thought, okay, now uh, the Europeans have a uh, right to use it, and we do too. We do too, yes. yeah. 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 Right. And they expected in a few years there would be another payment. Yeah. Uh -oh. yeah. So this is the presence of this. I don't know how many of you have gone down to the meadows looking for um, arrowheads or shards, but you can find them. And I'll show you a slide in, in a little while from the 80, uh, in the 84 flood, for those of you who were living in the valley at that point, the Connecticut River came, you could canoe from Arcadia, from the house at Arcadia, all the way across to the airport during the 84 flood. And at the end of the airport runway, the floodwaters dug this giant gouged out this giant trench, big hole, and spread all that stuff across the meadows, deeper than the plows have gone. And so uh, there were some people down there, and they found spear points and arrowheads. And, and years ago, 20 years ago, when I was very excited about looking for native points, uh, we, we found some material. It, it's been, needless to say, pretty picked over. In the late 1600s, this is uh, Metacomet, also known as uh, King Philip. And that really, uh, King Philip's war against uh, the Europeans uh, was, of course it wasn't the end of the Native Americans, right? But it, it was a very important point in the history of Native American people living in the valley in terms of a, a, a real point of closure. Um, and so there was, there were attacks here in Northampton as there were elsewhere uh, during that period. But that's the end of the 1600s. And then in the 1700s, mm -hmm. Northampton continues to grow. This is Jonathan Edwards. He was responsible for the Great Awakening. And it really helped put Northampton on the map. Um, the other things that were happening in the 1700s, Northampton didn't have like lots and lots of history in the 1700s, but there was tremendous slave trade, right? And there was also the beginnings of the whole anti-slavery movement. This is Phyllis Wheatley's uh, memoir writings. And she was a free slave living in Boston. Uh, and, and then, of course, so you have all that, that stuff happening. And then, of course, there is oh, the American Revolution. Yeah, that happens, too. <laughs> so <clears throat> Northampton, in, in and of itself, is, is a growing community. And, and by... Uh, this is, after, after the Revolutionary War, this is the next big thing that really changes Northampton. This is, this is the first uh, power canal built at the South Hadley Falls in 1792. It became active in 1795, and it was sort of the first big engineering endeavor, and it was profitable. It was entrepreneurial, and it's the beginnings of uh, real... Uh, Corporate activities for the public good, see, for the public and private good. But what happens is 
In the old, in, just like Native people, all those Europeans, they would take vessels up and down the Connecticut River. But there's a site that now we have sort of no sense of. Yes. Uh, and it's the South Hadley Falls. We know the place name, South Hadley Falls, from that village. But there was a series of shallow falls. Now the Connecticut River between the Holyoke Dam and other dams, it's really just a series of impoundments. But at that point, you could take a sloop uh, all the way up to Enfield. You could negotiate Enfield. But you could get to South Hadley. But those falls, it was a 50-foot change in elevation. And you couldn't do it. So this was the most expensive two miles of moving goods from the north to the south. And at that point, there was a lot of goods, uh, raw materials going down the Connecticut River. It's a major source of commerce. Uh, most of it going to Barbados. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't going to Europe, really. It was a lot of it just going to the West Indies. So this canal goes through, and suddenly the ability to move <coughs> goods changes dramatically. And people can now get in a boat and go all the way up and without really any hardship. And people start writing about this special valley. And this change in transportation makes a difference. And here's one of the earliest writings in 1760. And this is the beginning of where it really turns to the meadows. And the view here far exceeds all I have I ever had before. Hundreds of acres of wheat, rye, peas, flax, oats, corn. Looked like a beautiful garden, variously yet elegantly laid out. And there were a lot of other people. I'm sure some of you have read some of these things. But there's some pretty noteworthy figures, like this fellow, John Adams. He came through in 1771. And so people begin writing about how beautiful it is here, what an exquisite place it is. And that keeps going through the 1700s. But with the changes in transportation, things really change. By 1810, the, the population of Northampton has doubled because of the power canal, there, not the power canal, but the canal in South Hadley. By 1826, there are steamboats, and now they can go all the way from Long Island Sound all the way up to Vermont. They go through, well, they go, yeah, because they can go through the South Hadley Canal, and then they can go through the canal at Turner's. And so things, things change. <clears throat> things really change again in 1840, when the railroad comes out. But um, these, these, are big, these are big changes. Well, that's the railroad coming out from Boston. That's correct. Right. It's Going not through the one Springfield. coming up. It doesn't come up. It yeah. doesn't come up. It comes up a, a it, it late, later. Yeah. yeah, 1880s. We've got the New Haven, North Ham uh, Northampton Canal in between. That's right, which is basically a non-event. Yes, because it was <laughs> never profitable. No, no. But, What's happening is, as the place gets easier to come to, and people have already been writing about it, and more people start writing about it. And this, I just think this is the sweetest little quote, where Washington Irving says, I dare not speak about this enchanting place at present. I'm a little mad about it, you know? I mean, he's just, uh, and. And there are important, important figures who are talking about this place where we live now. And there's lots of others. Timothy Dwight, who was the president of Yale, he's back in the 1790s. His son is uh, writing travel logs. Bryant, Ode to the Connecticut River, most famous poem of that time. Quietly, now famous, Emily Dickinson. <coughs> Henry James comes later. And we've all heard about Jenny Lind, who is not an author, per se, but when she stayed here after her honeymoon, and she called it Paradise, it, the name stuck because she was a renowned figure. And so that, so the, 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 uh, the place gets talked about, right? And so people start coming. And then in 1821, they can come and they can stay. And at this point, people are taking the... Uh, some sort of transport and probably taking a stagecoach up or potentially a walking tour. The, this is the first initial uh, prospect house. And then it gets rebuilt various times. 1851 is sort of when it starts to look like that. And people come and more and more people come. And at that point you would uh, either take a stagecoach 
or you would walk, and then you would go on Hockenham Ferry, which is down through the meadows, and you would ferry across, and then you would walk up, and then later, later 1800s, you can see the tramway there. This is an older photo from the 1820s. And lots of people come. It's not just riders and tourists. Remember, 1820s is when the Industrial Revolution really kicks in in America. And so there's a little bit more wealth. There's now more ability to, to travel without such, such hardship. And naturalists come out from eastern, eastern part of the state. Artists come out. And Thomas Cole, of course, mm -hmm. comes out too. And all of these pieces com together combine, and with this travel riding, that this becomes, as I'm sure many of you know, the second most uh, visited tourist destination in, in the country, second only to Niagara Falls during the mid to late 1800s. That's right. That's right. Not still. Not still. Now we're going to not still. Reason for not still. Not why. And, and so, and it's on every tour. If you're going to make a grand tour of the United States, you're going to go to Mount Holyoke. So when when they were deciding, when Mary Lyons was decided to make a college, and she thought, okay, when, when am I going to call this place? Uh, <clears throat> and she, con she uh, consulted with Edward Hitchcock, who was then at Amherst College, and he had this, I don't know, Greek or Latin name, and she thought, Oof. Okay. And it was, all, it was all about marketing, because Mount Holyoke had instant name recognition. And so it was called Mount Holyoke. For that reason. Okay, so this is the peak here, folks. Late 1800s, 1870s, 1880s. But then, then things start changing, and we've got rail. Just, just thinking, not thinking sort of globally, just domestically and locally. What are the changes that that caused Mount Holyoke to become a place that is no longer so celebrated? And and what what was so magical about it in the 1800s was what, what Cole captures in that painting is, is really the, um, the American idea of the providential hand of God, right? The pastoral landscape, man over nature, but then wild nature, right, in juxtaposition. And it's that union that makes this landscape in part one of the reasons it's so celebrated. But there are all these changes happening just in America, okay? There's, there's railroads. You can go out west, yeah, and there's adventure. It's not you don't have to stay next door anymore. That's right, and <laughs> even even further in New Hampshire and Maine are places which you now go. So if you look at those travel guides from the later part of the 1800s, oh well, you can sort of stop along the way at Mount Holyoke, but it's not where you're going to go. And then just right here, in terms of the river itself, there are lots of changes here. There's tremendous log drives, which make, uh, needless to say, ferry transport a little bit more challenging, right? Maybe not the prettiest place to go across. This is right here in Mount Town Junction. And then some other things that affect the meadows are the major hurricanes, especially the 1936 and 38 hurricanes. Because what those, what those two things do is they they provide the impetus for the relocation of the Mill River, and they provide the impetus for creating the dike, which happens in about 1940, the dike goes in. Pollution. The Connecticut River is not a place you really want to be next to by the 1950s. <clears throat> and then the last big change in terms of kind of closing off the meadows, I think, for people is the is 91. Now here's, here's the oxbow that Cole painted. He painted in 1836, but it cut off, the river cut it off in a couple years before. But the dike, the dike runs around here. And here's, here's 91, which you all know, but sort of seeing it visually, it is such a boundary between access to the meadows. But, but the positive, positive of pollution and all that other stuff, right, is that really no one wanted to be near the river. So in terms of development pressure, 
the river was able to kind of do its own thing. And that's just what happens, is allowed to happen over the, like the last 80 or more years. <coughs> and so what happens is, uh, where are we now? We're like right about here, right? Okay. And <clears throat> so here, these are the two ponds that were built because of 91. I even take the oxbow, right? This is a uh, big marina over there, right? And they dig out, so these are ponds that were excavated when they put 91 in because they were filling in the floodplain and they had to provide flood storage. But this whole area down here is allowed to grow up. This whole area is allowed to grow up. And those are some of the very special, most special places in the landscape. So what we're going to focus on now is, a, is this chunk here, which is Rainbow Beach. And uh, Rainbow Beach Conservation Area, that chunk of forest at the, at the end. And what I want you to do is, here it is now. This is 2011. This is taken in, in this September, 2011. It's about from two miles above. Where and exactly gonna, is Rainbow Beach? Mm -hmm. Here's the beach. Okay, it's Rainbow Beach. And here's the conservation area. Okay. Uh, here's the airport. Yeah. Right on. And the go kart track. That's state road. And the what? The go kart track? Go kart track. The, yeah. 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 Harold's, Harold's uh, owns that of the uh, Harold's crane. <laughs> so, what was the question? That's state owned land, the forest. There's three different owners, but yes, it's all protected. So, watch it. So here's here's what's fun. Here's what's so wonderful about all those people coming during the 1800s, because we can see how change happens. So here we are, 1854, right? Okay, this is here's what the future Rainbow Beach, right? There's an island. Yeah. Okay. Now let's see. You know, artists they have license, right? So here's one from 1855. Pretty similar. Okay. Pretty similar. Mostly deforested. No, no, no forest left. Because you know, even when the Native Americans are here, tremendous burning. Okay. Oh. oh 50 years so later. Now look, there are two islands. <laughs> when? Oh. 1903. It's painting this one. A little bit. Isn't this fun? Yeah. <laughs> All right, now we have Randy Deal. Some of you probably know Randy. His interpretation, 1985, the meadows. Here's Rainbow Beach, a little bit of forest. Mm, can't see that island. Here's Mark Munier, just a little bit here. But look how that changed. All of this is now forested. How did those islands form, Laurie? Silt built up? Uh, yes. And, well, let me just finish this. So here's Scott Pryor, okay, 96. All right, there's UMass. Ah, things are changing. Okay, and here we are, 2000. This is the last image that I have. And so beautifully demonstrates what those changes. So Lola asked a question about those islands. Now, one of them, so rivers are dynamic systems, right? They're moving across the landscape. And here, it's a really unusual spot within the entire length of the Connecticut River. Most of the Connecticut River's channel is pretty in size. It's pretty deep. But when, and it's one of the reasons that floodplain forests, in general, are a rare feature on the landscape. There aren't many places where the land is low enough that you get just annual floods coming across. <coughs> And so here, here is one of those islands. So the river is dynamic. It's cutting here, cutting, cutting, cutting. It's cutting here on this side. It's cutting over here. So these people in Hadley, they're losing, losing, and we're gaining. And the reason it's called Rainbow Beach, I'll see it even better on the other side, is that if you look, it's like a crescent, 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 because this has grown, 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 and the trees grow up, grow up. I'm going to show you another slide, just a couple that, that you'll oh, see it so beautifully. But here's something that's really fun. In this particular image, see that? Mm. 
That's one of the old rock pylons where they ran a cable across to catch the logs. <laughs> All right. So floodplain forests are, are, are a very rare type of natural community on the landscape, period. Always. But because of human activity from Native Americans on forward, they're exceedingly rare. They're among the rarest and most threatened uh, community types in, in Massachusetts, and just sort of generally. <clears throat> and one of the things that's nice about them is that in, in some ways we talk about the pastoral landscape of the meadows. And for those of you who have spent some time in a floodplain forest, it's unlike any other kind of forest community <coughs> that we have in Massachusetts because it's so park-like. You have this broad understory of ferns and then an overstory. There's no shrubby saplings. There's not a lot of stuff going on. It's really very park-like and sort of appeals to that part of our manicured nature that we all you know, kind of <laughs> have in our African genes. Um, <clears throat> but, but what's special about them is not only uh, is that bec because they flood and in certain areas there are depressions and sloughs and levees, they have different periods, certain areas flood for a matter of days. Other areas, the water will stay for weeks, sometimes even longer, depending on the topography. And that dramatically influences what can live there. Because most plants, they, they can't survive having their roots saturated and inundated. Because plants, like us, their roots are taking up oxygen in terms of their basic metabolic processes. And in soils that are saturated, flooded soils, oxygen is able to diffuse something like 10,000 times less. It's just much, much less available. So the plants are sort of gasping for air, most plants. So, this, so the combination of plants that you have occurring in a floodplain forest is this very tiny set of plants that are able to withstand these pretty tough conditions that, that you know, when the tough get going. All right, so here's, here, look at this. You can really see how the Connecticut River has shifted. In the old days, the Connecticut River was here, and then it built, right? And it's been moving this way, moving, moving, moving. And you can see this. This is flooded. This is an April of um, 2002 shot. And you can see all the floodwaters here. The Connecticut is over. And I put this one on, too, because this, see that little line there? It's clear mm -hmm. here. This is the remnants of Shepherd's Island, which was here, and now the river has merged with it. This is the last little bit of the channel. The other island that was over here has been gobbled away. So I just want to spend the last parts, and I'll go a little more quickly through what's, what's here in these habitats. In this floodplain forest habitat, almost all the plants, the overstory is silver maple. And you can see they're both silver maple leaves. The reason it's called silver maple is in the springtime, or any time, when, it, when the wind blows, the underside of the leaf is, has a whitish bloom to it. So it looks silvery when it's blowing in the wind, not here in these pictures. There's also cottonwood, which we all know in early June because it starts to, quote unquote, snow in our area. It's one of the earliest trees to, to flower in early April, and by June, the seeds are, are spreading. In the understory, there are, it depends on what the soils are like. <clears throat> if it's fairly clay soils and silty, you have these broad beds of sensitive fern. Similarly, you can also have these lush areas of ostrich fern. This is a fern that grows you know, waist or shoulder high. It's the fern that people eat as fiddlehead ferns. But if the soil is a little more sandy, it's just a sea of metal, singing metal. And, and these are these uh, 
urticating hairs on uh, here, and you can't see them so clearly, but um, they cause a reaction that very, very quickly you, you, you react. And, uh, <laughs> and years ago, uh, 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 I, I went through, and I had, had long pants, but I had, it was a hot day, so I had worn a tank top. And I got into an area of nettle, and the nettle was high enough that it was, oh, so I always wear a long sleeve. Anyway, there are lots of plants that are there, but as I said, a relatively small sweet. This is poison ivy, the beautiful blossoms of poison ivy cluster uh, at the mist corner. Um, this is touch me not, spotted touch me not, which we have widespread in any sort of wet setting. But this is pale touch me not, and this is a plant that you see basically on floodplain forests or in rich music woods. It loves those rich soils, and by rich I mean calcium, phosphorus, very fertile. And this is a plant, this is a cow parsnip, and that's my daughter. And you can see how, how tall that's grown. And again, that's another specialist of the, of the floodplain forest. But here's one I want to talk with you a little bit about, and some of you know this before. This is what? Jack in the, Jack in the Jack pulpit. pulpit. And there are <coughs> different forms of Jack in the Pulpit. This is the regular one, which if you flipped over the underside of the leaf, it would have a very white looking underside. This is another one, which in the old days used to be called Variation Stewardsonii. If you flip over the back of the leaves, it's just green. And see how ribbed it is here? <laughs> but one of the things that's neat about this plant is that it's related to skunk cabbage, it's related to arum, philodendron, things like that. <clears throat> and so it's able, this is the, the jack is inside here, and that's able to heat up and it releases a fungusy odor. And fungus gnats think, oh, a mushroom to lay my eggs in. <laughs> and they come in, and the way this plant works is that there are male plants and female plants. And so this is when the top gets a little bit more exciting. <laughs> um, so the males, the males uh, normally mature first, and they release this odor. And the fungus gnats come in, and they go down into this tube, pulpit. And down here is where the flowers actually are. And <clears throat> they get caught in here, and, and the sides are so slippery, they, they can't climb up. And so they're just marching around here, but they're getting showered on by pollen. And then after 24 hours or so, there's a little hole at the bottom of the jack in the pulpit. It opens up. Beautiful. I'm out of here. And they escape. <laughs> but if it works for the plant, then they get duped by the next, next one. And that's a female. So they go back in. The female has no escape. Oh. So they go in, they're covered oh. on. <laughs> so that is a plant that occurs down in the meadows. And in the <laughs> but here's a plant that's closely related and is a rare species. Because you have this very tough set of conditions in a floodplain forest, most plants can't grow there, but there are a handful of specialists that do. And they're rare within our region. And this is one of them, and it's called green dragon. And it's a close relative, same genus as Jack in the Pulpit. But see, here's the Jack part, right? Mm -hmm. Way up here. And, you can, and then there's a little tiny green hood. And instead of three leaflets, it has seven to 17 leaflets. Mm -hmm. So when I graduated from college, I had gotten a small grant to look for green dragon. There were historic records. And it's really fun looking at botanical records in the past because Old collectors, not all of them, but in the past, some people would write things like Deerfield. No, that's not. Or, other, or another woman wrote on the Pecumptic Range things like, Where my husband knows I like to go. <laughs> <laughs> or, past the, the, well, she had one that said, Past the old gray birch. Well, the birch only lasts for like 25 years. So. <laughs> anyway, so I, I had looked up a bunch of records. And on literally my very first day, I bicycled down near Mount Tom Junction, and I got off my bike, and I locked up my bicycle, and there, Green Dragon. 
<laughs> and, but they have very specific preferences as to where they live. And, but in that same site, on that very same day, so I went down, and I'm looking, and then I see this thing. And that, huh, that is different. And let me show you how different it is. So there's Jack in the Pulpit, <coughs> there's Green Dragon, and that's what I found. Mm -hmm. right? hybrid? It's a hybrid. It's a hybrid. That's and hybrid. it's only known from Northampton, no. from this location. Um, it was uh, it never been reported before, and it turns out to be a classic <coughs> hybrid in that it's uh, sterile, like a mule, right? <coughs> and but the way it spreads, there are probably. Uh, well, I, I, I didn't do, I haven't done a, a complete um, count since then, back in the late 1980s. But this year I was looking, and back in the 80s I estimated that there were probably somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000. And the way Jack in the Pulpit spread, and this plant does too, is it has a corn, and it has these little knobs, and they break off, yes. and they're carried in the flood water. But it's very curious that Nowhere else has it ever been reported. So, among its among uh, so it's got this it's intermediate length of the spadix. The color pattern is different. The hood is different. It has only five to seven leaflets, whereas Jack and Pulpit has three. Green Dragon seven to seventeen, and this has five to seven. And it also has this aspect of hybrid vigor. Now I'm not standing next to it, but if I were, it would be this high. Not all of them, but a handful of individuals are just... Do they have a scientific name? Uh, no, they don't. They have Erysema trifilum x Erysema trichantia. Now, this is the other thing that floodplain forests are known for. And, and, <laughs> they're, and it's true, there are all those shallow ponds, and they make nice breeding ground for mosquitoes, but there's other interesting insects living down in the meadows. And this is Rainbow Beach, and this is a site which some of you, how, how many of you have been to Rainbow Beach? Okay, most, all right, not all. But you can see, here's the rainbow effect, right? It's accreting, and look at the little, the little plants are going, oh, there's a little bit bigger, there's a little bit bigger, there's a little bit bigger. So that's where we're going next. Rainbow Beach is the biggest beach on the Connecticut River within Massachusetts, so it is a, a heavily visited recreation site, but it's also the location for the Puritan tiger beetle. And the Puritan tiger beetle is, is a federally <coughs> threatened species. It's historically known from a dozen locations, but is now known from only three sites. Rainbow Beach, a location in Connecticut, and the Chesapeake Bay. It's got this just young population way down there. Um, <coughs> And it's, these are called tiger beetles. And you can see these incredible mandibles. And they are very fleet-footed. And they run along the beach with their long legs. And they chase down ants and other small vertebrates. And I'll tell you, that's, that's a good horror film movie. <laughs> and the fellow in the... <clears throat> That's right. The fellow in the turquoise is a guy named Chris Davis, and since 1997, he's been monitoring these because they're federally endangered species, federally, federally threatened, trying to figure out how the population is changing. And the way they do that is they catch a beetle, and this is a sure sign that you're, if, if you meet the guy in Northampton, he's got a fingernail like that. <laughs> so they have these different color, kinds of uh, model paint, and they paint a unique code on the back of each the thorax here, of each beetle, so that then, during the month of July, June, July, they go with binoculars and they walk the beach, and it's a mark and recapture, and in that way they can estimate the population. What's the lifespan of the beetle? It's three years. And so they try and paint it in the... Oh, the, oh, the, oh, the adults, the adults on labs live for about 35 days. But the larvae, which you're going to see in a minute, oh, okay. uh, live longer. So back in 1987, 
there were um, 25, and it's been a very unusual uh, pattern. They actually moved some larvae from Connecticut to Massachusetts, uh, and they put some on different banks so that they thought that they would establish, but Rainbow Beach is the only place where they've been found. Is that the total number they counted or the estimated population size? Uh, this is total number counted. I have, I don't, I have the report uh, there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, what, what's the, what's the y-axis? I can't read uh, the numbers. Number of tiger beetles. Yeah, but I can't read the numbers. 50, read the numbers. Oh, so the, the high is about 198 okay. and the low so is 25. And this last year was a very terrible year. They were down to 32. And so here's the larva, and they live uh, two or three years in these little tiny holes. <laughs> and, they, and they come up, and they're a sit and wait predator, and then wham. But as a result of living there, they have some vulnerabilities. And <clears throat> one is that nowadays the Connecticut River is so controlled by dams that there aren't big rafts of ice coming down and ripping out the vegetation. And so vegetation is growing up, and so um, and that's where the lar the so the most of the copulation happens down near the wetted perimeter, right near the river's edge, because the 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 beach itself can be up to 140 degrees the sand during the summer. So the beetles spend most of their time along the edge of the wet Connecticut River shoreline too. But then they lay their eggs up here along the forest edge. And so what uh, we have a course that we teach, and so our kids have gone down and helped do some habitat restoration and rip out plants and <clears throat> try to create better beetle larvae habitat. And I think it's a pretty good exercise for them. So, but it's a, it's a complicated issue because there's, you know, the, why are there so few beetles? Now, what was the population like before? I'm sure because of dams, a lot of sites that they used to breed on are now totally inundated. Um, you have ice, and then another issue, which I think has been pretty well resolved, but recreation is, a, is an issue. Uh, I don't know how many of you have been down on a beautiful summer weekend on Rainbow Beach, but you might have 90 to 100 boats uh, on, on the edge. And so that's probably interrupting some of the mating activities uh, of the beetles. But in the last 10 years, really, thanks a lot to Chris, um, the, there's been, I think, a, 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 it's a pretty compatible relationship between recreation users. OK, just a couple bit more things. You know, the, the meadows, those are two of the most special areas in the meadows, <coughs> but there are others. And one of, the, one of them is a habitat that was created with the construction of 91. And there are a couple of vernal pools, believe it or not, between the dike and 91. And I haven't been there in a long time, but one of the things, for those of you who don't know what a vernal pool is, it's a special temporary wetland that has water for part of the year, but then, voila, <laughs> dries up. <laughs> and because of that, these are fish-free environments. And a lot of organisms have evolved to breed and live here, some exclusively, and others uh, can take advantage of other habitats too. But one, uh, some of the things that you can find in the vernal pool near, within the meadows are some wood frogs, little fingernail plants, but here's, I know, get to the heart is racing, this is a clam shrimp, and it's, um, it's about, uh, it's about one, two millimeters. But it's a state-listed species, and it's one of only three sites I know in the valley for them. So it's a, it's something <coughs> to be, you know, proud of. It's, really, what's the name of it? it's a clam shrimp. Oh, clam shrimp. Oh, I didn't hear what you said. Uh, yeah, clam shrimp. Yes, it's related to Daphnia and other crustaceans, actually. One of the things that you also hear that would be in those vernal pools, but also in all those sort of temporary water bodies as the floodwaters come through, and you have any low depression or American toads, and you've probably heard them. They start around the beginning of May, and uh, they have a trill. Um, and the males all get together, and they're pretty excited after a winter of 
uh, inactivity. And so they fight. And years ago in the Bear Street Marsh, a different conservation area, my husband saw a, a toads were all calling and a muskrat swam through. And they just jumped on it. Basically, anything that moves, they think they can try to mate with it. <laughs> so, uh, here's a male. Uh, and he's calling. And here's another male. And he's trying to mate with this male just because the male's moving, right? <laughs> and here's success. So you can see the tiny male and the much larger female. And then they produce very different than wood frog egg masses or spotted salamander. These long strands, they almost spiral strands. And then they become these very black little tadpoles that around uh, mid-July emerge as little toadlets. And they're, they're widespread in the meadows. There are other things that you can see here. There's bank swallows. There's lots of different birds that you can see, some that are specialists out in the fields, others that like those forested, forested settings. Um, there's some rare dragonflies that you can find along the shores of uh, all the, in the meadow areas. So it's a, it's a section that's got lots of neat stuff, um, even though so much of it is cultivated. There are these edges and areas that the forest has grown up where you can find some neat things. So there are some, some things that are um, troublesome. Poison ivy is one of them. But some of the things that I'm sure some of you have worked about, worked on and thought about are some of the non-natives. And <clears throat> there's uh, the cast of unwanted is a garlic mustard, bittersweet, money wart, Japanese knotweed, and purple leaf Those are the biggies down in the meadows. They're the sort of biggies generally, but um, something to think about. And then this is the topic that probably uh, many of you know all too well. Uh, so, uh, but here's the good news. Here's Rainbow Beach. Here's Shepherd's Island. Right? Yeah. Look at how much all the dark green, this is Arcadia. This is State Hospital. All of this light green is land that's in Chapter 61. And that doesn't ensure protection, but it's a little bit more. And then to give you a broader context, but still sort of parochial, right, just looking at Northampton, you can see how it fits in with the rest of the conservation land in Northampton. And then here <coughs> has some 61 properties, but mostly just <coughs> land. So you can see. Here's Skinner, and there's some nice floodplain forest that's been protected here. All of this area around the ponds has been protected. This is very nice floodplain forest that's been allowed to grow. And, and this, this chunk, these two pieces, this is the most, the largest blocks of contiguous floodplain forest anywhere in Massachusetts along the Connecticut along the River. There's no place that, that there's more. In the meadow? Nope. No. No. Not as much as here. So Northampton, you know, the beauty of the meadows is it's close, close to downtown. And the same thing can be said today as was used for advertising for Smith College uh, 100 years ago. Ten minutes from the campus, Mount Tom, in Connecticut River Meadows. So thank you very much. It's been nice to be here and uh, t talk about a place where I've spent some time in the past. and. Uh, it was a nice opportunity for me to spend some more time there preparing for this. So thanks very much. Will you take some questions? I will. Is that right, friend? Do you uh, plan to do any um, work in the mills in the future? I don't know. Maybe so. That's my guess. <laughs> <laughs> Can you um, talk a little bit about the canal, the South Haddon Falls Canal? I'm not envisioning the Holyoke Dam, and I'm, I can't don't, understand don't where... Don't envision the Holyoke Dam. Because it wasn't there. It didn't exist. <laughs> right, so that's exactly where the canal would have been. Uh, no, it's, it's, it's just upriver from that. Okay. Uh, All right, logistically. Yeah, I think it's, it's upriver, 
It's upriver from the dam. It is upriver from the dam, but not much upriver. Okay. But there was basically like when you go on that section where um, the entrance to Mountain Park. Yeah. And from there south, it was a series of riffles. Okay. And uh, so they created this uh, triangular stone ramp that then they would drag the boat, they'd unload the boat, drag it up, put it in a canal, raise it up, float it two miles. So it had locks? It had, it had the rudimentary locks, and then they released it past the last set of rapids, and off it went. Mm -hmm. and, uh, before then, everyone was pulling, pulling, pulling. It was the most expensive two miles of, of uh, moving cargo. And you, you say two miles to where? To, to the, within, like if you were coming from Vermont, and you were moving cargo, Right? And you yeah. had a boat. The cost of shipping, your shipping charges, like because they had to unload the boat, take them by horseback and cart, yeah. down around, then load them on another boat and then go <laughs> south. So all that work, that made that the most expensive stretch. And once that opened up, boy, things changed. And then because it was so successful, so successful. Then by 1798, that's when Turner's Canal goes through. And George Washington, he did come up here, and and, uh, and he thought that's what he got. He got canal fever, um, and he thought, well, we'll just we'll just build a canal out through Ohio. That's right. That was the, the CNO or yeah, yeah, yeah. along the Potomac. Yeah. yeah. Was that on the South Hadley side of the river or on the it's on the South Hadley Falls village side of the river. Right, but it's on it's, it's on, on the east, east bank. Yeah. It's on the east bank, you're right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Are there any remnants or don't you know? Uh, there's a, a small... Um, yes, you can see a limited amount, mm -hmm. but very, very limited because a lot of it has been inundated as the dam went up, um, yeah. because the dam went up in the 18, first one I think was 1840, roughly, oh yeah. Yeah, roughly. and then another one went up that was higher, so that's just like a big impoundment now. Mm -hmm. I can get you the name of the person who's extremely knowledgeable about it, I did a radio story years ago. So is the, the area that we think of as the meadows, was it pretty much all at one time this floodplain forest, or did the river flooding kind of keep it meadow-like? I think the Native Americans kept it meadow-like. Uh -huh. They burned, they burned so that it. they could then plant their crops. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I, I'm sure there was more, but when you see the location, I mean, I'm making an assumption that that section that was called Bark Wigwam was called that because when they first settled here, there were some Bark Wigwams down there. So I, I, I mean, there's, as far as I know, there are no written accounts of what, what it was like, but that they could, in 1660, start parceling out the meadows in 15 to 86 acre blocks. It suggests that much of that was, was, was open. Uh, um, so same, excuse me, same was true up in, up in Deerfield, uh, which is another important native, native area. I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, from your knowledge of the meadows, what would you say are the key priorities that have to be addressed in terms of preservation and conservancy in the area? Well, you know, I haven't I haven't given it a lot of thought I, uh, until working on this presentation. But a lot of you know, most of the forested land has been protected. One of the issues and um, Sheila Marks is here. Uh, we, we were talking that one of the issues, and some of you know it, like remember years ago that there was a gate put up over on the other side near the go-kart track. And that really made a big difference. And you know, that area, what, what I know as Bai's Pond, some people know as Triangular Pond, those 91 ponds, people go in there and they, they just dump junk, you know? And so 
It seems to me that it would be great. I don't, I don't know the politics of putting another gate up, but I mean, there's, there's negatives because recreation gets limited, but there's positives that it's less abuse. Um, but I mean, there's, they, uh, the city is doing, uh, I, I don't know, I, I suppose it's, it's more you can get some of that chapter land uh, completely protected. We have to look at the parcel data. I guess I'm going to dodge the question. Okay, I'll be here. Oh. I, I just have one sort of, well, I'm just wondering what it is about the meadows that provide such a wonderful habitat for the fireflies. It's just magical. <laughs> <laughs> well, they like moisture, and yeah. uh, they like a uh, little bit of brush, a little bit of, but there are other places that you, you might be dazzled by fireflies, you know, but it's, it's a good year for fireflies, too. And there's several species, so. Yes, yeah. Um, when you're approaching Rainbow Beach, or if you go along the edge of the river, where it's still um, field, yes. there are a lot of slides going down to the water. And I've tried to figure out, is that otters, beaver, muskrats? I look at the tracks in the, you know, in the adjoining land, it seems like a mishmash of tracks. But, uh, do you have a sense of what's making all those slides? I don't know, but, you know, there, there's, there's beaver activity and there, and there are otters, so... Just, I guess we just have to. We have to spend more time there. Put some wildlife Absolutely. cameras out. Yeah. One one thing um, we found out in setting up this event is that you've written a fabulous book about this, uh, all of this, and, um, and we're hoping at some point maybe we can even work with you to get it published because we kept thinking this would be great. We all want one. <laughs> so, so maybe that's something something to come. Yeah. So. Well, thank you very much thank for coming. And I'm going to say one, actually, I'm going to say one more thing, which is, uh, this is important to me, because, and, 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 and a treasurer's report was given earlier, and I've donated my time tonight. And all of us in this room are the people who care most deeply about the meadows. So what I guess I, I would like to ask all of you is that, that you make some pledge to this group or some other conservation organization um, as a some kind of way to help. Um, it would be a, it, it, it would be a real pleasure to know that this organization had benefited uh, a little bit more from my presentation tonight in a way that maybe you could pay the tipping fees to dump out a load of <laughs> junk uh, that's down there or some some small way. I, it could be ten dollars. It could be five dollars. It could be two dollars. It could be a thousand dollars. It could be ten thousand dollars. <laughs> I'm, just, <laughs> I'm just finished fundraising uh, for the West Hampton Library, and I know the importance. At one point, when we we got a large leadership gift, and all of those of us on the Capital Campaign Committee, we looked around and we realized we were the ones who cared more, probably, than anyone else, and so. Um, it, it falls, it, I mean, we're all asked over and over and over again for charitable contributions, but I guess I would ask, I'm asking, I'm appealing to you uh, to support the organization. Uh, and thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.